<laughs> uh, DP's not here, so I mean, somebody's got somebody's got to rip you. Mm -hmm. He absolutely would. Um, we are talking about holiness today, and uh, we're talking about holiness because the kids are talking about holiness. And uh, as as we work our way through the New Testament, uh, it's it's not necessarily chronological. Um, but, but this curriculum does move through uh, in themes and, uh, and kind of through the lens of individuals, <clears throat> or at least through the pen of individuals, I should say. And so uh, we're going to be talking about uh, holiness. That's the theme today. And uh, Peter writes a lot about holiness. Uh, he really certainly threads that theme of holiness through, uh, through his letters. <clears throat> and, and so when I mention holiness, what... What comes to mind? Uh, what do you guys think of when you think of holiness? You can throw one word answers out. You can throw whole phrases out. Heck, you can throw the Bible at me. You can throw Bible verses. What do you think of when you think of holiness? <clears throat> yeah. Yep. We have the, the two songs, Holy Ground, that we sing. I like to sing those songs back to back because they... they they were written to kind of transition, you know, the first one into the next one. Um, but that, that, yeah, that uh, sacredness. Uh, God is holy, and God says, you, you need to recognize that I'm holy. Take off your sandals for where you stand is holy ground. That, that encounter with God uh, was such a holy experience, and God says, the ground that you're on, this is holy ground because I'm here. Uh, what else? Humble, being humble in front of God. Yeah, being humbled before God. Um, yeah, it's not like, it, it, you know, our, our language is interesting today, and there's, like, not only, I, we're, I guess we're like, we're old souls in younger bodies, I guess, because we complain a lot about, like, the, the a lot of disrespect that kids have towards adults, where they walk up and they're like, sup, man? And, you know, and we look at like stuff that's going on with police officers and people just berating them and badgering them just because they're cops and giving them a hard time. And, you know, um, there's a sense of people doing this with God, too, where it's, it's like God is like this cool, you know, this cool dude that we're going to go in and, you know, we're going to like lift up our hands, man, and like be super chill with God. And I'm like, God, like, God will melt your face off because he's just so powerful and wonderful and magnificent. And, you know, the way that we approach God, uh, especially in light of his holiness, uh, ought to be a, a super humbling experience. Not that we can't be ourselves in front of God. I'm not saying that. Um, but God deserves our absolute, complete honor and uh, submission and uh, you know, uh, being holy because God is holy uh, is a very serious commandment. Uh, you know, we find that in Leviticus. Leviticus, Leviticus 19 uh, talks about being holy because, because God is holy. Uh, so wh what, what is holiness? Uh, what is it to be holy? If we're commanded to be holy, what is it? What does that mean? Sure, yeah, yeah. We talk a lot about God's foundation, uh, Psalm 89, 14. Um, God's foundation is righteousness and, and justice, and then steadfast love and faithfulness flow from it. Um, yeah, righteousness, which is, you know, the term is a balancing of scales. You know, that's what righteousness means, being right by balancing scales. You don't tip the scales one way or the other for, for for or against somebody. Um, you know, righteousness is balanced scales. And so because of that, uh, God, is, God is set apart. You know, holiness is being set apart, right? Something different. Um, what makes God different? What makes God holy? What is it about God that makes him holy? I guess another question is what it is what is it about us that makes us holy? What, what about God's will? That's right there. 
Yeah, God's will. What, what is God's will? Yeah, God, God's will is that nobody should perish, right? God doesn't want anybody um, to be disobedient or to perish. Uh, he's not a God who sits up and laughs at people and, you know, mocks them and is like, well, you dug your own grave. Um, that, that's not who God is. It sounds like a simplistic answer that God is fully God. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, well, it, it, it's, it's not that simplistic an answer because... Uh, many people allude to this. A lot of the prophets allude to this uh, or just point blank say it. They're like, can, can these sticks that you guys bow down and worship do all of this? Can they make the mountains? Can they, uh, can they set the perimeters on the ocean? You know, can they uh, set the earth into motion and all of its, you know, all of its satellites, the moon and the, you know, all the stars? And can, can your sticks of wood and your stones make this? Uh, you know, and the point is uh, very rhetorical, obviously not. You know, God, God is God, and God is powerful and magnificent and wonderful. And I just love, I love um, modern science and technology and our, our advancement to be able to see what I, what I would call looking into the heart of God, you know, looking into the universe and, and seeing the power and magnificence and magnificence um, and how expansive it is. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's infinity. There is no end. There's no beginning and there's no end. And scientists are saying now there is no beginning and there is no end to the universe. It's so big that um, there is no beginning and no end. Uh, mathematically, there's no beginning and no end. Yeah. And that, that's what I'm kind of thinking. Where the children of Israel, when they turn to God, the wood, stone, and things like that, that's where they did the book of an abomination to God. Yeah. 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 Um, so I want I want to read some of this because there is a lot of uh, text here, and then we'll kind of um, unpack this the best we can, and you know. A few minutes time. I would love to settle on uh, 1 Peter, especially the first two chapters for uh, weeks, but uh, we are, lo and behold, uh, moving forward. Um, <clears throat> starting at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's a mouthful. Um, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that, that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Going back to what text said about the will of God. God's will is that none of us should perish. Uh, we ought to have confidence in this. Um, and that's going to be our sermon today. You know, it's this confidence that we can boldly stand before God and know uh, that we're saved. Concerning the salvation, verse 10 the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you. Can you imagine that? The prophets 
had this revelation. They knew that they weren't writing, per se, uh, to their current audience. They knew they were, it was revealed to them that this massive coming glory and this, this Messiah and this salvation, this, they're writing to future people. And I think of somebody, uh, one prophet comes to mind who I think really got this and, and actually lived a very depressing life, Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. Um, here's my question. Jeremiah wrote, I mean, his whole central message is uh, repent. Like, I know this destruction is coming. I've seen it. I know it. God has revealed it to me. If you don't repent, all of this destruction is, is coming to, to Israel. Um, Jeremiah was, he was beaten. He, the, the scrolls were taken and, and burned. Uh, he was imprisoned. Uh, you know, all these bad things happened. Then he had to go back and rewrite it again. Um, and my question is, did, did people, did Jeremiah see repentance in his day? He didn't, did he? I mean, to my knowledge, unless I'm missing something, I don't see any repentance on the part of people during Jeremiah's day. And Jeremiah witnessed all this massive destruction that he was telling people. This is happening. Like, this is set into motion. God will carry this out. He just wants you to repent. He wants your heart. It didn't happen. And then you fast forward several hundred years, and you find Jesus quoting directly from Jeremiah. I think that's so cool. And I think that's incredible that Jesus, the Son of God, is making this wild case based on the words of Jeremiah. And I think, you know, Jeremiah knew. He knew he was writing to a future, to us. He was writing to us. He was writing to a future people saying, this is what's going to happen when, you know, when Christ comes, when there's this, you know, this repentance and this salvation that's ushered in, this is what God will do. Jeremiah never, he never got to see it. I think how, how incredible is that, that he stuck with it. And look at, look at, I mean, kind of a compare and contrast, look at Christians today given up on their faith altogether, given up on, in their belief in God, what are some of the things that, that cause people to give up their faith? I mean, you can name them. What are some that you've seen in, in your own life where people just renounce God and they're like, you know what, God, God doesn't exist. Like yeah, uh, most common is, is hardship, suffering. Uh, specifically, uh, people dying. A really hard one, and I'm not making fun of people. I'm not mocking people. I'm just saying this is it's a reality. Um, the loss of a child. You want to talk about something that shakes faith? It shakes it hard. And you look at the life of Jeremiah, and then look at what Peter says uh, about suffering. You're you're gonna suffer in this lifetime. And so think of the big picture. Think of, think of the, the confidence that we have in this salvation and knowing that God has set this up for us, that God is calling us into heaven. Um, I forget where I left off. Um, yeah, 12. So it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you and the things that, are now, uh, that have now been announced to you through uh, those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things into, into which angels long to look. There's an a cappella song, the group a cappella. Um, angels long to look into these things. It comes from this verse. A uh, really cool song. But even the angels are looking into these things that God has revealed to us. Uh, verse 13, Therefore, preparing your minds for action... And being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that would be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. 
But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. And again, he's quoting Leviticus 19, and that's repeated um, throughout the Old Testament scriptures. Uh, But he's quoting from Leviticus 19, be holy because I am holy. God's telling his people that. Um, Leviticus 19 is also rooted directly into the, the greatest commands. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, Leviticus 19 is all about treating your neighbor with kindness and compassion and feeding them and, and caring for them. Um, you know, be a, be a decent human to your neighbor. I have a question. Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah, we do. I mean, yeah. <laughs> What'd you say? That's true. I mean, even if they wear ugly sweaters, we, we still love them. <laughs> That's right, that we don't like them. Um, well, I think this is an interesting thing too, Wendy. Like, um, I think our definition of love has, has it's really, um, I call it schiz- schizophrenic. We have this schizophrenic definition of love. Um, I love my kids. I love my, I love my neighbors. Love your neighbors yourself. Um, it, if, I were, if I were about to have some major tragedy happen because of, of something that I was doing wrong, would love say, oh, oh well, as long as he's happy, Right, like if, if, if my wife and kids, say that I'm like, I don't know, we'll just use physical, some, something physical. Um, I'm smoking like nine packs of cigarettes a day and, you know, drinking like a case and a half of booze and I'm just like, you know, eating chips on the couch and I'm just like, you can physically see the body just begin to deteriorate fast. I mean Fast would love say, well, uh, let's heap burning coals on, on, on Jimmy's head and let's, you know, let's support him and love him and cherish him and just pour over him with love because that's what love does. Love your enemy, right? Is that love or is love, does love say, we need you here. Your kids need a father. You got to get your crap together and straighten up now. And we're telling you this because we love you. And we want you, we need you here. We need you here as a father. We need you to be present. We need you to be sober. We need you to be with us. We need you to be supportive. We need you to be encouraging to the kids. We need you to teach our kids, uh, instruct them, uh, show them an example of what it looks like to live a Christ-like life. Which one of those is love? And, and so, you know, we, we twist this definition of love, and I see it all the time. I see it especially, I mean, I, I, I hound on this all the time in the realm of abuse. It still blows my mind after 12 years of speaking on a very public national platform, um, how many churches uh, violently come back at me because I take, I take a really hard stance that if you've abused an innocent child, you don't belong around them. You've proved that you can't be around them without without ruining their lives. Um, so get away, stay away. Uh, you don't belong here. Um, and I get such pushback and people are like, but that's not loving, that's not, um, you know, we should embrace everybody, we should let everybody into the church. I'm like, that's not loving. That's not loving to the children and that's certainly not loving to the abuser either. I mean, it's like pouring like shoving a funnel into the mouth of, of an alcoholic and pouring alcohol down it saying, I just love you so much. You know, like why, why would you? I, right. I mean, it's, it, it's so, you know, I think our definition of love is really messed up. That's right. Yeah. I mean, like, it, it can mean it, it, whatever it takes for that person, what's best for that person. 
Yeah, but it's not just what's best for that person. It's what's best for that person. According to Leviticus 19, what's best for that person for the sake of everybody in the circle of influence of that person. Like, you know, the, the person who's laid out wasted drunk on the couch and, you know, is yelling at the kids and beating kids with, you know, with a stick and, you know, just flying off the handle at every little thing, uh, losing their job, not being able to support a family, you know, that's, that's not showing love and kindness to the children. I mean, that's going to, it sets in motion this generational, unto, you know, unto the third and fourth generation, right? Like that scripture is not, I don't think it's, um, I don't think those scriptures about, uh, you know, these things will happen under the third and fourth generation. I don't think that's um, prescriptive where God's prescribing you know, this horrible thing, these horrible things are going to happen to your kids and their kids and their kids. God's not prescribing that. It's more descriptive. God's describing what's going to happen and unfold um, if you don't get your life together. You're going to see this horrible stuff unfold in the lives of your kids and their kids and their kids under the third and fourth generations. You're going to see just mayhem because of one decision, not one decision, but a series of decisions from one person. You know, we all have this ripple effect. Um, all of our decisions have these ripple effects on many, many people. And I think that's why this call to holiness is so, uh, it's so poignant and, and, and pointed and blunt. You know, Peter, Peter, who, by the way, really screwed up a lot. Um, I think of when he was in Pisidian Antioch and Paul just blasts him into the next generation. Um, like Paul says, I had to publicly call Peter out to his face because he was undoing everything that we did in Pisidian Antioch. Uh, Peter was not associating with, uh, with Gentiles. Uh, Peter was treating them poorly. Peter was being very discriminatory. Uh, and Paul had no... Uh, he had no tolerance for it. And so love compelled Paul to not only confront Peter, but to do it publicly. And that's one of the things, uh, I hear this argument all the time. In fact, I just recorded a podcast um, a few days ago with the Christian Chronicle. And they said, uh, when we've written stories about you and your family, um, some of the arguments were, well, you're putting your dad's sins out on public display. I'm like, no, he, he did that. Um, and Ephesians 5, interestingly, tells us to what? Expose the deeds that are done in darkness so that those, those hidden things can no longer be hidden. Well, how do you expose that? Privately? One-on-one? -on -one? Matthew 18? That was another question. Well, what about Matthew 18? Why? Um, one of the criticisms is you reported your dad and Matthew 18 says you're supposed to go to your go to your brother first and you know ask him to repent. And I'm like, what's he going to admit? Well, that's, that's actually not what it says, there, right? Isn't it if, if he sins against you? Right, exactly you right. That that's thing. exactly right. Yeah. That and it's if your brother sins against you, right. yeah, yeah. So, so. you go and show him his fault. Then da 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 da. So you know, I, I think we we blend all this stuff together. And, and we really don't understand this foundation of holiness. This, this foundation of holiness is a very serious charge, right? Like this, it, it's not like, well, we're all sinners and, you know, a sin is a sin is a sin. No, like this call to holiness is rooted in Levit Leviticus 19, which is really essential because Leviticus 19 is all about um, treating your neighbor a certain way because that sets into motion all these other effects. And so the way that we treat somebody or mistreat somebody is going to set into motion a whole series of ripples. Think of, think of the stone. All of us have stones, uh, little pebbles. We'll call them pebbles because I don't want to think of, like, I don't want any analogies about stoning, the, you know, Stoning people, being the first to cast a stone, that's not what I'm talking about. We all have little pebbles, which is um, a series of decisions that we make. And each of us, every decision we make, 
we drop that little pebble. And if you look at that little pebble when it drops on still water, what happens? Yeah, ripples. How far out do those ripples go? To the shoreline. Yeah, to the shoreline. Even if you can't physically see it by the time it gets to the shoreline, those waves are still waves that reach the shoreline. It might be a little, little bump, but it's still there. It always, those ripples always have to reach the shoreline just because of science and physics and all that stuff. Um, so the decisions we make doesn't just affect, well, it's my life and I'll, you know, I'll do whatever I want. You know, you ever hear that? It's my life. I'll do with it what I want. I'm an adult. How, how many of us have heard that? I'm an adult. I can make adult decisions. Yeah, those decisions affect many people and those ripples go on and on and on and on. Uh, we were called to be holy. Um, we have just a few minutes left here, about five minutes. Uh, verse 18 uh, knowing that you were ransomed uh, from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with precious, the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without, without blemish uh, or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, again, all of this, Peter is strongly appealing to Leviticus 19. Uh, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever, and his word is the good news that was preached to you. So put away all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men in the sight of God, cho chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but, uh, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. Then he goes on, you're a, you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. This theme of holiness is so deeply embedded uh, in Peter's first letter, you can't get away from it. Um, and so Peter, Peter's not equating holiness with a self-righteous life where you're, you're like, well, I'm, you know, I'm a good little Christian and I don't ever mess up and because God is on my side and you know, I'm going to show everybody, you know, what it's like to, to live a good Christian life. And No, Peter, Peter, Peter knew what it was to mess up. Do you think Peter really comprehended that? Do you think he really got that, what it is to mess up? I think pretty, uh, pretty point blank. I think to the point where I don't, I don't know how Peter, unless he really, truly, fully grasped the grace of God... I don't know how Peter went on to preach. And so quickly. You know, in Acts chapter 2, Peter stands up with full boldness. Stands up in front of thousands of people, boldly and courageously just preaches the gospel. I mean, raw and unedited. Um, how did Peter have the confidence to do that? 
he, he understood what he was preaching. He understood that holiness sets us apart. And, and, and if we reject, it's interesting, right? Peter's the one writing about that. If we reject Christ, if we reject him, he becomes this, the cornerstone that people rejected. He's, he's the foundation. Uh, what, what was Peter famous for? Denied Christ, right? So I think this really, Peter's, Peter's writing not just from Scripture, but he's writing from experience. Um, don't reject Christ. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think so. No, today's sermon is, is about, um, it, it's a really cool, it's a really cool passage. Um, I think one that we unfortunately um, overlook a lot in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And, um, you know, Paul's language is interesting because he's, he, he's talking about, hey, we're, we're not, uh, we're not kind of weak like Moses was. And I'm like, wait, wait a second. Like I underlined it in my, in my text and he's like, yeah, we're not, we're not weak like Moses was, but we have boldness. And I'm like, Mo Moses, weak? Like, yeah, Moses was a little intimidated of Pharaoh of Egypt at first, but, but then, like, Moses led people across the, the Red Sea. Moses went up on the mountain, I mean, with God enveloped around that mountain with thunder and lightning and this big cloud. And I'm like, and then Moses came down, and saw the corruption of, of the people, and he broke the stones, and then he marched right back up you know, that mountain, and he got, got the commandments again. And I'm like, Moses, we're not weak like Moses? Um, but Paul's making the strong case. He, he, he veiled his face, and we now unveil our faces because we have this confidence before God that those people didn't have. They didn't, they didn't fully grasp what we fully grasp and have available to us now. So, yeah, no, I, I think absolutely um, they didn't comprehend fully. I mean, I think certainly, I mean, obviously there were revelations given to the prophets and they, you know, they had this knowledge that was just unreal. And I think they knew a lot of, of that knowledge, but um, I do think it was limited. You know, I think Paul makes a really strong case that um, there was this weakness and this lack of, knowledge and lack of glory that we now have available through Christ. Uh, Christ is that powerful. All right, we're out of time. Uh, thank you guys very much, and we'll see you in a few minutes.